Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta bhavantu sukitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar and I'm here with the beginning of a new series The Concept and the Reality in Early Buddhism it's based on a book by my teacher, Jnanananda. And Bhikkhu Jnanananda wrote this book well, when he was like 30 years old. And it's astonishing in its depth, clarity, and power of conception to draw the distinction between concepts and reality is virtually equivalent to drawing a distinction between insanity and enlightenment. <laughs> uh, there are two terms, very important terms in the Buddha's teaching. Papancha and Papancha Sanya Sankha. Papancha is a concept, but not just a concept, a concept that we believe in, a concept that we are invested in. Uh, in other words, we want to cling to it. It's valuable to us. And Papancha Sanya Sankha is like a chain reaction. You've probably seen those animations of atomic chain reactions where one atom gives off a particle and then it splits another atom and they go on cascading into an avalanche that creates a chain reaction. Well, that's what Papancha Sanya Sankha is. It is a chain reaction of concepts that once begun cascades in the mind until it becomes an uncontrollable avalanche that overwhelms the person who started it. And instead of thinking, I have this concept or I am creating this concept, the person sees the concept as reality as something impinging on them. The famous science fiction author Philip K. Dick once defined reality as that which, once you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. And of course the problem with us is we don't see that much of what we hold to be reality is actually a belief. And even though we stop believing in it volitionally, deliberately, we continue to believe in it automatically. Well, let me give you a small example. A person sees a sheep, a white sheep. That's the reality. And then he makes a concept all sheep are white. Now, the concept is not true. We know there are black sheep, brown sheep, all different colors of sheep, even spotted. So, the concept is wrong on his face. It's untrue. But this fellow has only seen a white sheep. So he thinks it's true and he'll defend it as true. And for him, it is true. So now let's use a concept that we're all invested in, the concept I am. Now the concept I am, according to the Buddha in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, is a conceit. It's a concept but a special kind of concept called a conceit. I am. Because it asserts the reality of an existence without any evidence to back it up. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, now everybody's going to say, no, wait a minute. I am. I'm real. This is me. This is I. Just see this body, this mind, this personality, a sparkling smile. No. All those prove are that there's white. There's a white sheep. 
Huh? There's a body. There's a mind. There's a personality. It's like saying there's a white sheep. And then you go on to say, but I am. Not only that, I am existing eternally. The theories of the soul and so on like that. That's a concept. And from your point of view, the concept is true because that's all you've ever experienced. You haven't experienced a state without the concept or the conceit, I am. So you can't imagine what that might be like. Just as the person who's only seen a white sheep can only think of sheep in terms of white. So from this concept, from this uh, statement, this verbal statement, I am, comes a proliferation of other concepts. I am, this is me, this I am, this is mine. Huh? Then you are, that is you, that is yours, and so on. And then the relations between <laughs> you and I, self and other, myself versus the world, are all built on the substrate of the concept I am. So I am is a papancha because we're invested in it. It means something to us. It has value. We're willing to defend it. And then from that grows an avalanche of concepts, a papancha sanyasanka, of related ideas built on that substrate or foundation. So now I hope these terms are clear. I love to define terms before beginning any kind of discussion so that we know what we're talking about. Um, I want to read the prologue, Nyanananda's prologue from his book. And this explains the artwork on the cover, by the way. So here it goes. The sightseer sitting on the crag is taking in a view of the landscape around him. His eyes are on the distant hills, dimly visible through the mist. Above him, an overhanging creeper is waving in the morning breeze. His view shifts from the distant scene to the dewdrop at the tip of the creeper. All is quiet and still. The ruddy dawn breaks in through the mist. A ray of the rising sun alights on the dewdrop and the sightseer adjusts his perspective suitably. The dewdrop gets transformed into a spectrum, and a view gets transformed into a vision. Before the advent of the Buddha, the seers were concentrating on as many as 62 views, but none of them saw the sight. It was just above them, so near and yet so far. They never thought that it could be in the dewdrop of their name and form, too bland and uninviting to arrest their attention. But once their gaze got fixed on it in the correct perspective to catch the ray of the dawning Buddha sun, they saw the sight, a vision in contrast to views. And this is an excerpt from Nyanananda's other book, from topsy-turvydom to wisdom. So what does this mean? Well, of course, it's an analog. It's a metaphor. It's a picture. It's a story trying to describe a process, a process of evolution of concepts from views to vision. What is a view, anyway? A view means from my perspective, what I see. So what I see from my perspective is going to be different from what you see from your perspective and so on. 
So the problem with views is that they are limited by the perspective of the viewer. I have a different perspective from you and so on. So everybody has their views, but does anybody have the vision of reality? What really is? You see, the problem with a view is that it's limited. It's limited by the fact that it's mine or yours. Although there are some views that are shared, many, if not most of them, are built on a substrate of concepts rather than reality. Science is an attempt to base concepts firmly on reality. But of course, what the reality is, is dependent on your interpretation. <laughs> and since each scientist has his own view, his own point of view, and his own ego and so on, they all disagree on the meaning of the data. So nice try, science. Nice try, empiricism. Nice try, phenomenology. <laughs> but what we have to do is draw an inference from the evidence and realize there is such a thing as a vision. A vision could be defined as a reality from which many people draw their views. For example, I'm looking at the camera from this side. You're looking at the camera from that side. <laughs> I see a little metal box. You see a picture on a screen. So even though we're talking about the same reality, underlying reality, the views are different depending on the point of view. So what's happening whenever we adopt a view is that we are asserting the existence of something, isn't it? Let's say I'm asserting the existence of this cup. I can say the cup exists. It's full of some very good green tea. <laughs> Still hot, by the way. Now, before the cup came into your view, it didn't exist for you. The cup was outside your frame of vision, your frame of reference, your angle of view, whatever you want to call it, your viewpoint. So for you, it was non-existent. Now, wait a minute. It's my cup. I put it there. I know it exists. It's within my frame of, of vision. But if we discuss and I say, well, did you see my cup? You'll say, no, there's no cup there. I don't see any cup. And you're right, <laughs> according to your view. But according to the vision or the reality of the whole place, the cup was there all along. If you had simply turned your point of view and perspective over that way a little bit, you would have seen it sitting next to me. So the difference between a view and a vision is that the vision is based on reality and includes all possible points of view. So that's the difference between the ordinary, uninstructed person's view of reality and the view of a Buddha or an Arhat. The Buddha very clearly sees the difference between a view and a vision. And he especially can see the difference between a papancha and a papancha sanyasanka. When a person is overwhelmed by the cascading effects of their own views, they are actually in a state of delusion, isn't it? I can say, yes, the cup exists. You can jump up and down and insist it doesn't. Uh, but we know in actuality, it does exist. So you are deluded because you have this wrong view. So anytime we create any view, it could be a right view or a wrong view, and it can change. So are views anything to rely on? Are they anything to invest in? No. 
So I'll give you an example in the Potapada Sutta. Potapada comes to the Buddha and he asks a series of questions called a tetralemma or a quadrilemma. Basically, a quadrilemma similar to a dilemma, except instead of having two poles, it has four. So, for example, does the cup exist? Does the cup not exist? Does the cup both exist and not exist? Or does the cup neither exist nor not exist? That's a tetralemma or a quadrilemma. So Potapada came to the Buddha and he says, does the Tathagata exist after death? Or does he not exist? Or does he both exist and not exist? Or does he neither exist nor not exist after death? The Buddha remained silent. So Potapada said, what's the matter? Why aren't you answering my questions? You simply remain silent. And the Buddha says, Potapada, these are all views, concoctions, papanchas. They don't reflect the reality, so there's nothing I can say about them. And Potapada tries to push the Buddha into saying one thing or another. But the Buddha doesn't go for it. He doesn't accept. He says, I have given up views. In fact, his exact words are, views are something that the Tathagata has done away with. He has done away with views. And this is true also of the Arhat. One who has understood the Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha, has also done away with views. Well, so then what are we talking about here? Well, we don't have to invest in a view in order to speak compassionately to help other people get over their views as well. We don't have to be uh, adhering or attached or clinging to a particular view in order to offer it as a help to someone who is suffering. The Buddha readily admitted when he was asked that the Eightfold Path of Buddhism is a concoction, it's a fabrication, sankhara, something speculated, something imagined, huh? an imaginary view, just like we were talking about, a papancha. So what does that mean? Well. The Buddha's path is a path that leads to no path. It's knowledge that leads to no knowledge. It's a mastery of the art of consciousness that leads to the cessation of consciousness of ordinary things. And it's a fabrication that leads to the end of fabrications. In other words, it's a view that leads to the end of views. But that's a very special kind of view. A self-nullifying view. Like, this sentence is false. <laughs> is it true or false? But in the process of investigating why this sentence is a conundrum, you might learn something about views. So... <laughs> Views are unreliable. They lead to a one-sided view, a one-sided realization. Okay, So we're so attached to being, I am. In the beginning, we have to oppose it with an opposite view, I am not. There's no self. Okay. So instead of self view, personality view, we have impersonal view or voidness view or emptiness. See, these are gradually more and more subtle uh, versions of the same thing. 
that view which cancels out the views that we're invested in and are currently deluding us into seeing only one side of a much more nuanced and complex picture. So the Buddha's teaching is a method, a path, a way of undoing these views. But then once we undo them, we don't always swing to the opposite view. Huh? Commonly people, for example, who believe in a certain religion, if they lose their faith in that religion, they go to another religion or they may become an atheist. Or, but in any case, they will oppose their former views, isn't it? They argue against it. They say, no, these views are wrong. That's why I left that religion. I don't believe in it anymore. But this is an ordinary person, someone who's following the teaching of the Buddha, also gets rid of their views, but not by negating them, by letting go of the clinging, by realizing there's no one to cling and there's nothing to cling to including the view that there's no one to cling and nothing to cling to. Then we get to Nibbana. Yeah, we get to the real thing. So, in other words, <laughs> the real vision <laughs> is seeing not that this view is right, this view is wrong, or conversely, this one is wrong, that one is right, it's about seeing beyond views completely. The example is of a target. Let's say um, shooting an arrow at a target. That in the usual way of shooting, the target is where the arrow ends up, right? But what if I have a target made of paper suspended in the air? The actual thing I'm trying to hit is behind it. Okay, so now I shoot the arrow and it goes through the target and opens up into this big space behind it. So that's what the Buddha's teaching is. The Buddha's teaching is like a target and these different states like emptiness, no self, neither perception nor non-perception, and even Nibbana are target, paper targets that we're meant to go through rather than into, that we're meant to transcend once they've outlived their youths. And so there's one more sutta that I want to direct your attention to. This sutta describes crossing the river, crossing the flood with a raft, the near shore is dangerous and unsafe, unstable. The uh, far shore is safe. So one improvises a raft, just thrown together out of whatever is around, branches, sticks, vines, string, whatever. And then by our own effort, we paddle across this river and we get to the other side. Now, what do you do with the raft? Do you say, oh, this wonderful raft, and carry it on your shoulder for the rest of your life? No. You say, oh, thank you very much, raft, for bringing me to the other side. And then just set it down on the bank or throw it back in the water or bury it or whatever and go on. Leave it. It's of no use anymore. A person who is climbing up on the roof, if he doesn't need to get down anymore, he can just throw the ladder. No attachment. It got you where you wanted to go. Don't need it anymore. Let it go. Don't carry it with you. That's real Nibbana. So, of course, this is very paradoxical and so on and so on. We'll get all into the details of it in this series. But the point that I want to make is in this image, the drop is a view. 
If you look into a drop of water, look through it, you see a certain view of the surroundings refracted through the water, like a fisheye wide-angle view. But if a ray of sun comes through that drop, it will refract it into a spectrum. And that's the vision Jnanananda is talking about. Rather than just see the view of the drop, see the vision, see the sunlight, see the background as it's refracted through the drop. Uh, and in that tiny drop, this great broad vision of the environment is seen. That's the function of the Buddha's teaching, and that's what we're going to be discussing in this series. Are you ready? Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukitatta Bhavantu Sukitatta